life. Wow. What an act to follow. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming and listening to <laughs> what I have to say today. Thank you to Ula and Leanne and everyone at West uh, for this fantastic day. It's really stimulating to be here and to hear all these different presentations, and I hope I can offer something uh, to the discussions of the day. So I'd like to take these 10 minutes to give uh, a brief view overview of Metzger's early engagement with science and technology from interdisciplinary co collaborations in developing auto-destructive and auto-creative techniques to his editorship of the Bulletin of the Computer Arts Society page and his involvement with the British Society for Social Responsibility in Science. Catchy. So um, the premise, of course, is that science and technology underpin Metzger's aesthetic theories and his activist activities. So a few years ago, I worked with Gustav on a show at Kettle Jard in Cambridge, uh, which looked at his early connections with the city and specifically the work that he made between and around two lecture demonstrations he gave at the university in 1960 and 65. We stretched it a little bit, but... Um, in this period, uh, the lecture dem demonstration became an important, if not the primary platform, for Metzger to introduce audiences to his developing artistic theories and auto-destructive and auto-creative techniques. Does this work? Um, yes, it does. <laughs> In these lectures, um, Metzger would demonstrate techniques using water, ink, graphite, and other materials such as liquid crystals to create visual effects in the form of light projections alongside other creative or destructive processes such as the acid nylon painting, an ex example of which is on display in the exhibition currently, or something he, um, he had proposed but decided against at the Architectural Association, uh, but which the students carried out anyway, um, dropping of a glass panel from a height to smash on the ground. So in these lectures, he, uh, he talked about science. He likened the material transforming techniques he demonstrated as forms of visual research relating aspects of the work to, I quote, some concepts of quantum theory, physics and perceptual or cognitive processes within the autonomic nervous system as well. He aligned his practice to that of the International New Tendencies Movement, which uh, dates roughly between 1961 and 73, which, among other things, espoused experimental research methods from gestalt psychology. He also talked about the role of art in society, about the pressing issues and possibilities for making a new way of making art informed by its social and political context, and a new way of thinking about society and the way science was shaping post-war Britain. So in Britain in the 1950s and 60s, scientific developments and technological innovations, the kind of things that led to space exploration, mass production techniques, the atomic bomb, was rapidly transforming society and the structures of knowledge production. It was a time of tremendous ferment. The Cambridge Don C.P. Snow caught the mood in 59 with a divisive lecture on the differences between the humanities and the sciences. Labour leader Harold Wilson swept to victory in 63 with a new vision of socialism forged in what he called the white heat of technological change. He later offered Snow a ministerial position in his new government. So the work Metzger made during this period, which was primarily developed around the auto-creative and auto-destructive techniques, and many of which he demonstrated in these lectures. His approach was not to reject the scientific progress that he saw being co-opted by capitalism and the military, but as he put it to his audiences in Cambridge, to use science to destroy science. At the Social Impact of My Modern Biology Conference in 1970, he addressed the speakers. We are faced by issues that are deeper than the political level. The problem also resides in the particular fabric of science and technology, not merely in its social applications. It seems to me, and I am speaking as an artist, that the most challenging and profound and ultimately most constructive research activity in science is that effort to establish new and revolutionary insights into the nature of science and technology as it's developed in different col cultures in the past thousands of years. So, 
Six months after Snow's lecture in 59, Gustav took up the gauntlet thrown down by Snow, calling for artists to collaborate with scientists, engineers, in his first manifesto. He lobbied Lawrence Alloway, then the assistant director of the ICA, to establish contact between artists and scientists, and continued to propound the integration of art with the advances of science and technology in his third manifesto, and declared in his ARC article in 1962 that the next step in machine art is the entry of artists into factories. Do note here that this was years before high-profile projects such as Billy Kluver's Experiments in Art and Technology in the US and John Latham's Artist Placement Group, both of which happened in 1966. So, as far as his own practice was concerned, the first manifesto listed materials and processes from ballistics and cybernetics to nuclear energy that could be used to create autodestructive art and firmly located this new art form in a field of inquiry that aligned the artist with scientists and engineers and attempted to open a conversation between scientific and artistic research. As he wrote, autodestructive art is the transformation of technology into public art. He made contacts with engineers and public programmers, meta metallurgists, architects, and other scientists, including Elwin Llewellyn Evans, who worked in the Corrosion of Metals Research Group at the National Chemical Laboratory and provided critical input into the Autodestructive Monument, which is on the top left. Beverly Rowe, then Head of Applications at the London Computing Centre, was one of several experts in computer technology who helped Gustav develop the concept of five screens with computer. There's a little drawing there in between the ones on the left. Um, Gustav also had Evans um, in the computer unit at Imperial College produce schematic drawings for the project, as well as the plotter drawings that we saw in Matthew's presentation. And somehow, Gustav managed to negotiate access to Titan, which was the University of Cambridge Mathematics Department's mainframe computer, <laughs> which all of the other departments had, had had to beg time to get access to. And he managed to persuade various people, including a Richard Stibbs, who was a research fellow at the Center for Land Use and Built Form Studies, an interdisciplinary research body in the architecture department, and Tony Nutborn of the engineering department to produce more design uh, studies for the five screens piece using Fortran, 60 <laughs> Fortran 66, which is an early computer programming language and the drawing on the top right is, is one example of this um, showing, I think, the evolution of the period over the first three years of one screen. So, he also worked with the protein chemist and immunologist Arnold Feinstein at Cambridge to develop the liquid crystals technique. Journals like this 1964 copy of Scientific American featured liquid crystals and provided rich sources of ideas. Metzger managed to get hold of, after seeing this article, he got hold of some sample crystals from Merck, the chemical company, and went over to Arnold Feinstein's lab literally the day before he was due to give his lecture in Cambridge in 1965. Apparently, it took them until 3 a.m. to develop a method for manipulating the crystals, and the following evening, Gustav made his first failed attempt to demonstrate these liquid crystals as part of the ambitious program of lecture, of, of light projections in the lecture demonstration. But, um, so now I want to talk about the project in Swansea uh, briefly, because um, in that uh, university filtration lab, as we've just heard, Metzger developed a number of processes and techniques that transformed materials from one state into another and with the results being temporal, kinetic, sculptural events. He described the event later as a purely scientific construction for, us, for aesthetic purposes. Um, in Cambridge, I worked with Gustav to, as we put it, creatively revisit these pieces that he made in Swansea, as well as some of the techniques he developed in the lecture demonstrations, including dancing tubes on the right, which, for a gallery context, involved the introduction of a compressor which cycled between build-up and release of pressure and also engaged a relationship between the viewer and the piece, the energy, or the matter of the thing. 
We also made a version of drop on a hot plate that involved balancing the flow of water coming down the hot copper tube to the hot plate with its evaporation rate on contact with the plate. You can see this detail. It produced a droplet in constant motion, but apparent stasis. Very difficult. <laughs> Balance, or the relationship between opposite elements or forces, is a frequent theme in, his wor in this work. It's also at the heart of dialectical materialism, which is a philosophy of nature and knowledge that in 2009 Metzger declared was to the present day the field in which he was in. I, it will explain everything I've done. Dialectical materialism is, like it sounds, a relational concept of the world in which everything is interconnected, rooted in material reality, the physical stuff of existence. It's also often associated with Marx's historical materialism, which, forgive my rudimentary philosophy, is essentially the theory of dialectical materialism applied to human relations. In the 1940s, Metzger was influenced by the radical politics of anarchism and Trotskyism, and particularly, of course, Trotsky's version of Mas Marxism, which is premised on the theory of permanent revolution. Metzger's drop on a hot plate was a simple, clear demonstration of scientific principles and the expression of an aesthetic of dialectical transformation, embodying the rhetoric of revolutionary change at a symbolic level, with elements and forces in a relational state of constant transformation. I'd like to point out here also that the Swansea project came about because Gustav met John in 67, in July 67, at the Dialectics of Liberation Congress. And uh, that Congress was a high point of 60s counterculture, spotlighting, uh, among many things, the central role that psychology and psychiatry played in linking the individual and society in the wider political struggles and cultural discourses of the period. The inherently transdisciplinary nature of psychology seemed to offer critical tools for understanding society and the means to change it. And as Alexander Dunst has noted, thinking revelation and revolution together as liberation at that time. So to think about the work he did in Swansea, uh, get back to that. In Swansea, for the first time, he rigged up a sort of shower cubicle to create an enveloping dark space in which to show the, the liquid crystals pieces. And uh, from the images that John's just shown, we saw the kinds of perceptual um, immersive effects that he generated in that lab. Um, he had already explored the perceptually immersive potential of light projections in the lecture demonstrations and the early light shows he did with Mark Boyle and the concerts for The Who and Cream. And um, we can read from the poet Dom Sylvester Hudard's descriptions of J Gustav's light projections at Ravensbourne, um, a certain psychedelic tone. So these were, let me put it to you, these were pseudoscientific consciousness expanding experiments in which revelation and revolution were interlinked. Gustav was serious about producing new and revolutionary insights into the nature of science and technology. So. Right on the heels of Extremes Touch, he came back to London and began an extended period of research for the two-part article on the history of automata that Mathieu mentioned. The page on the left here is a very poor example of the illustrations he used to accommodate, accompany his text. This article expounded the theoretical and historical basis of his critique of technology. In it, Gustav made explicit connections between the exquisite craftsmanship and engineering innovation of ancient civilizations and the manifestation of automation in machines and factories of modern society. He painted humanity as stumbling blindly into a technological kindergarten without appreciating the consequences. It also marked a shift in the way Metzger engaged with science. So in April 69, he became the founding editor of Page, a copy of uh, which you see on the right. It was the Bulletin of the Computer Arts Society, as I've said. He edited 27 issues of the Bulletin. Uh, which in characteristic style he both exploited and challenged. 
He kept abreast, he kept abreast of the latest technologies and took opportunities to test it in works such as his plotter drawings. He also established a distinctive editorial position, as Matthew mentioned, putting ethics and ideology at the heart of the debates he nurtured around computers and art. He also occasionally authored articles such as that we see here in page 11. It was a comprehensive list of every article and news item containing the term social responsibility that had appeared to date in the communications of the Asso Association of Computing Machinery and Associated Journal of the, <laughs> of the Association of Computing Machinery and the magazine Computers and Automaton. It was dryly titled Social Responsibility and the Computer Professional, The Rise of an Idea, Part One. Around about the same time as he joined Page, Metzger also joined the British Society for Social Responsibility in Science, Buzras for short. Buzras uh, represented a groundswell of concern over the social impact of science. They campaigned on issues such as pollution at work, industrial agricultural practices, and the British military's use of technologies of repression in Northern Ireland. They also held conferences and produced a journal, Science for People. You see here. Early supporters of the society included scientists and philosophers Francis Crick, J.D. Bernal, Bertrand Russell. Most had sympathies with the political left. At Busra's inaugural meeting on the 19th of April, which was opened by Nobel laureate physicist and molecular biologist Morris Wilkins, Metzger was invited to join a small art science group sub subgroup of Busra's, and he also got involved with a new science group a largely intellectual discussion group which met, met to discuss Thomas Kuhn's ideas about the structures of scientific revolutions. And perhaps surprisingly, unsurprisingly, after much heated debate, produced a manifesto, Harmony, written in 1970 but never published. Busra's died out at some point in the 1990s. Its members spoke of a burnout and a lurch to the right with individualistic Thatcherite politics in the 1970s. Radicalism gradually evaporated and the culture of art and science changed fundamentally. But for Gustav, science remained at the heart of the problems with society. And I'd like to end with quite a long and abridged quote from Harmony, which, uh, as you can see, was co signed by Kit Pedler, Gustav Metzger, David Dixon, Robin Clark, Jerry Rabbits, and Peter Harper. The traditional techniques of European civilization for control of our environment have developed to the point of creating desperate problems that we cannot solve, can, that cannot be solved in their own terms. But the knowledge and skills we have achieved can, if enriched and transformed, provide the basis for a harmony of the human life in nature. Our present comforts and their insoluble problems were achieved by a science and technology developed in the context of an alienated and fragmented concept of man in the world. The whole enterprise of science is a branch of the apparatus of production, of commodities, of war, and of consciousness. For survival, as we as a species must regain old attitudes and acquire new skills for our interaction with the world around us. In simplest terms, our planet and its resources must be a heritage to be protected and improved for our descendants. Instead of consuming materials and energy, we must fit into stable cycles of transformation of energy and matter. The knowledge which enables such a harmony to be achieved without millennia of prior experience can be gained by a natural science transformed for this function. Its new style will be necessarily of unity rather than fragmentation, of synthesis of the natural, the social, and the spiritual aspects of a situation rather than their destructive separation. It will find its insights and inspiration not only from natural philosophers and creative engineers of our recent past, but from poets, prophets, and craftsmen, famous and nameless, from all cultures and history. The first focus of struggle will be among those who work or who, or whose work or training is in the manipulation of symbols and service of people. They're conditioned by their past and their situations to participate in the inhuman use of human beings and of nature, but in successive generations of membership of the class, they are exposed ever more sharply to the insoluble personal, moral, and spiritual contradictions of the entire inherited way of living and thinking. We shall proceed by developing our utopia, 
itself a heritage of past endeavors and struggles, and by mapping the path back from it to the present as we plan and practice the way forward from now, we invite friends and comrades to join us. Thank you.